is preaching today, so he is, uh, you guys all know who he is. Scott decided he doesn't, uh, he, he, it would be a difficult time to preach right after uh, everything on Friday, and so Julian stepped up and said, I'll take care of it. So we're excited to hear Julian this morning. Um, he is a lot more charismatic than Scott, so make sure you guys say amen at least three times each. Three times each throughout this message, okay? Everybody's got to say amen at least three times. Yeah, yeah. yeah we go early. We go more early so we say more. Um, I have a dad. All of you that have a father, say hi. Uh, and doing my uh, third grade, right around the time that I was eight years old, mom and dad separated. During that time, uh, my dad decided to take mom back into further Mexico and kind of return her uh, to her parents. And my grandfather said, of course you can leave my daughter here, but when you married her, you, uh, <clears throat> you didn't have a uh, those kids, so you can just take the kids and, and you, can, <laughs> you can leave my daughter here. <laughs> so my dad kind of stayed, <laughs> had to stay a little longer than, than expected. So during my third grade, um, most of my, my first grade and second grade, I did right there across the border in Ciudad de Cunha, Coahuila, Mexico. That's just University. It was the other side of Del Rio, Texas. And then uh, I did my third grade in Torreón, Mexico. Not exactly in Torreón, a little town named Tlahualilo, Durango, Mexico. That doesn't mean anything to you either, but I'm just telling you stuff. Um, and during a period of my, when I was eight years old uh, to the time that I was 13, my dad was um, almost invisible in my life. Um, I learned to sh shine shoes, to help around the house financially, a milk house, which I've forgotten, and don't invite me. And uh, <laughs> I, I did whatever needed to be done. Mom will, would wash uh, laundry for neighbors, and I would be the delivery guy. Whatever needed to be done. And so I developed a very interesting relationship with my father. Before you get too far, I still, to this day, have an awesome relationship with my dad. My mom and dad are pastors, and uh, dad and I confide in each other about everything. So I just, because sometimes I forget to tell you things, and you leave out here and say, he never did say whether his daughter died and then resurrected again. My daughter's very much alive, and she's played the piano for you, so that's the one that I left hanging last time. Now you're good. Um, <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to leave hanging today, so uh, so that's why I'm making sure that I, I, I cover that. I want to go to chapter 14 of the book of John, and I want to have a conversation with you about the words of Jesus Christ with his disciples, as I was just literally just sharing with you a little bit about my relationship with my father. This is the relationship that Jesus is focusing on this particular time. Jesus says to his disciples, chapter 14 of St. John, do not let your heart be troubled. Do not be afraid, don't be cowardly. Believe confidently in God and trust in him. Have faith, hold on to it, rely on it, keep going, and believe also in me, he says. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. I, if it were not so, I would have told you, because I am going there to prepare a place for you. I'm reading the Amplified Bible, that's why you finished it for me. And if <laughs> I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back again, and I will take you to myself, so that where I am, you may be also. In the place where I'm going, you know the way. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the only way to God. I am the real truth and the real life, and no one comes to 
my dad's house, except when I have read this so many times. Of course, first time I read it, I read it in Spanish, but I didn't want to go into that with you. And I didn't understand what Jesus meant because the first time I read it, my dad was not yet a Christian, and I could not understand him. that told me. A few days ago, Stephen was sharing with the youth about his relationship with God, and some of the young people were looking at him kind of funny. He said, I have no idea what I'm talking about, but Scott does, and he told me he had an awesome relationship with his dad, but I didn't. I, I love that openness about Stephen, especially about other people, but... <clears throat> What he was saying is so true. During the years 95 to about 2000, I was uh, involved with a ministry called Promise Keepers. A ministry of Promise Keepers did awesome work uh, with men's ministry. And one of the things that we would find, especially on the small groups, uh, they used to call it small men's group, but they weren't really small. Some of those guys were really big, and I was really <laughs> confused. But, it was a small group of men is what it was. And in those groups, sooner or later, we would touch the subject of dads, fathers specifically. And as we would talk about almost every time, we would touch a nerve, and there would be a guy, or all of them, at one time they would say, as they would speak about their relationship with their father, and uh, how that affected their relationship to God, and how they reacted to God, and how they knew that if we had a guy that didn't have a very good relationship with their own earthly father, eventually they had to make that connection because that disconnect with his heavenly father, with the God Almighty, was there because, and let me say it this way, because they understood their relationship to Jesus. That wasn't a big mystery. They, they already knew this Jesus was a real cool guy. We all know that Jesus. I mean, he is awesome. We talk about him all the time, and in church, that's what we focus in. But Jesus does this turnaround, and, and they ask him in the same uh, chapter, um, if Philip in verse 6 said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and then we'll be satisfied. That's all we need, just show us the Father. But Jesus said on verse 9, have I been with you for so long a time, and you do not know me yet. What he's saying is, me and the Father are one. So if you think I'm cool, you have seen nothing yet. The Father is even cooler than I am. And not only that, he's got an awesome house and I'm looking forward to going there. And in my thinking and preparing for today's message, I was going to bring my Mexico uh, t-shirt with a big flag of Mexico, put it on it, but just imagine. I didn't want to scare anybody, that's why I didn't do it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but my dad has a home in Mexico, and by the way, if you want to go with me one of these days, I'll take you. It's big enough for, for you, and the, the land is big enough that if you don't want to stay indoors because it's too hot. But we used to receive youth groups from all over the place, and the majority of them would rather sleep in the roof during that week that we spent out there. So if you ever want to go, my dad's house is cool. But the most awesome thing about my dad's house is not the house, it's not the brick and mortar, it's who's there. And yes, you would say mom, but today is not about moms, you've got to have to back off for today. Today is about dads, today is about fathers, today is about our relationship to God. There's a little poem that I don't know, but I'm, I know enough about it to kind of mention what it talks about. It's actually by a, by a Spaniard, and he wrote it in Spanish. But it is actually the Argentinians that love this particular poem that I'm about to murder in English. But the poem goes something like this. He says, honey, and again, I'm totally paraphrasing this. I want to talk to you about something. Specifically, I want to talk to you about our children. This is a husband talking to his wife. He said, I don't understand why all day long you tell the children, wait until your father comes home. I don't know if you have said that, but why is it that every single day, before I even take my shoes off or lay back in my lazy boy, paraphrasing totally, you have to tell me all about the things that Johnny has done, 
why do you have to give me a list of all of these different prisoners that I have to ask what they've done today and what all I have to do to them? Not only that, don't you realize I too love them just like you do? And I would like, instead of their hate, I would like for them to love me a little bit. Please don't tell my children, wait until your father comes home. What does that do to children that grow up thinking the bad guy in the family is the father? Now, how does that translate, and let me say it this way, and I think Craig would understand, when we say the same thing and we talk about authority, we say, the policeman is not your friend, the policeman here is to get you, the policeman's a terrible person, he's gonna find you and he's gonna fuck you one. Right? I'm with you. I'm with you. Well, we do the same thing for the teacher. Now, the teacher's not what I mean. The teacher's a terrible person. The teacher doesn't know a squad, and, and he's just there for the money, which is totally true. <laughs> <laughs> we do it for pastors. If the pastor ever sees you doing something, make sure you don't do bad things, because we do this constantly all over our world. We have seen Al Bundy, and whatever he's doing in my family today, or the family, and all these other different shows like Homer Simpson as the bumbling idiot that the father is throughout our world, throughout our community, and the fathers have loved just as much, but haven't gotten to enjoy that love. Because the respect isn't there. You understand what I'm saying? Because we have belittled and destroyed the position of the most important title any human being can walk with in this earth. And that's the title of Father. So that kind of affects your relationship to God. Why do people that love Jesus, who's the, understood completely that Jesus is their Savior, have no clue about God the Father. They mention him without understanding that the most awesome being that has ever lived is death. Jesus referred to him, and the Bible refers to him twice as Abba, Father, or Daddy. When, the, when we under, I was in Swiss Spanish, that's what that was going to uh, When we understand when we understand, listen, even when we come for the first time in Christianity and we are asked, we are asked to become Christians, what is it that we're told? Would you accept Jesus as your personal Savior? Well, yeah, it's Jesus. I love Jesus. He's cool. He's trying to do anything. And, so, and Jesus says, whatever I see my Father do, this is what I do. I am the Father. I want Chapter 17 of John, when he is explaining to his disciples, he says, I pray that you all will be one, and here's the explanation, as the Father and not are one. We got a long way to go, but that's not the message. The importance of accepting Jesus is also accepting the plan of salvation, which includes for us understanding that we're accepting a Father God that has the best interest, has the best desires, and the best plans, Jeremiah 33, 3, for us. I got great plans, great ideas, great thoughts, great desires for you to make you better and to affect in you things that you haven't even thought of. We have a Father that at the same moment that we have accepted Jesus, accepted us as his children. But here's how our mentality, and we're human, so this, come, this comes as no surprise. It's, yeah, you're telling me about this awesome God, the Father, but yeah, look, he killed his son, the terrible guy. You know, he did. He let it happen. You know why? Because he loved you, and he loved me. He loved us so much, the Father did. Look at the obvious verse that we all recognize immediately, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, but insert Father, that for whom for the Father loved me, put the world, put you. For the 
Father loved me so much that he gave his only beloved, the one and only Son he had. If we do a little shift, if we change a little word here and there, not that we're changing the meaning of the word, we're changing our understanding of that God. That when he does what he does, whenever he does it, we can understand, thank you God. Thank you, God, because you have a better plan. You have a better deal to offer than whatever my human mentality, whatever I can conceive, whatever I can understand is limited my, my humanness, but you have a better plan. He always did. See, we have an alternate plan of salvation. We all did. And one of them is we accept Jesus. That's the plan that God the Father created. But we deny Jesus and we rely on our own ability on our own righteousness, that's our plan. But that's the human plan. That's what we call religion. Religion is the creation of men, human ability to create a God in his own image. That's what religion is. That's why being religious doesn't save anybody, because this is about our relationship. We've always said that, but we usually focus on our relationship with Jesus. Yes and no. Yes, because it's true, but no, because it's not a complete truth. That's half of the truth. Because having our Heavenly Father totally involve our, of, on our decision making totally changes how we live, how we move, and how we decide things, how we react to situations, because now God is for real. See, we don't have much of an issue with the Holy Spirit. We've always understood that, that He's doing everything just kind of over here and, and, and we go to heaven we don't know where to put it but but we understand this the God the Father and whatever he does is okay but if we happen to have a terribly really terrible relationship with our, our earthly father then we're okay with the, the idea that he's far away that's why I mentioned my own relationship because about the age of nine years old, my dad moved to California. He left us in Mexico. He moved to California for three years. We heard nothing from him. And mom was okay with it. Yeah, it was the best thing that ever happened to her until she knew Jesus. Once Jesus shows up, you know, I had become the man of the house, pretty much. Now, at that time, I was the oldest of five. Later, we had two more. That grew up in Christianity, they didn't know about BC before Christ. And uh, as my dad returned, mom and I started going to church. She and I came to salvation and we understood about the Lord. But I had an issue with God. So I'm reading the Bible and I'm reading that scripture, that part where it says to take out the beam that is in your eye. And I'm thinking, at that moment, I'm reading the Bible for the first time, paying attention to what it says. And the Bible is telling me, take out the beam that is in your own eye before you can take out the little thing that is in somebody else's eye. And I'm thinking, my dad needs salvation. My father needs God. My dad needs to come to repentance. And my dad needs to kneel down in front of my mom and, and, and tell her how terrible a husband he's been. That's what he needs to do. But then the Lord says, no. You're just as lost, and you need salvation. Before I could understand my relationship to God, I fell in love with Jesus. That happened because the Holy Spirit made that happen in me. But the whole plan, that whole original plan of salvation, the Father's idea. He's an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above. I, I, I'm stopping right there. Keep on thinking the rest of the song I saw tonight. He loves me. He loves you. But see, the coolness of Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit, we can handle that. We can deal with that. But the relationship with the Father sometimes is tainted in such a way that we look at our earthly Father and go, uh, this is the pattern that I have. This is the example that I have. And don't get me wrong, I am trying to be the best dad that I can. 
And some of your awesome fathers, and even the most awesome of fathers, fall short. The most wonderful husband, the most wonderful father, will mess up. And so we look at the whole crucifixion thing, and we put a back mark on the dad, and like, even he messed up. No, he didn't. That's what I need us all to understand. Our Father God loves us. He loves us so much that has done whatever, whatever it takes to have us be with him. It's an exciting story. It's an exciting reality. But for us, Sometimes to even make the, the prayer and say, okay, we accept Jesus. But have we ever stopped to say, we accept the Father. We accept the Father and His plan. We accept His desires and we accept His designs. And someone is looking in the mirror. I'm getting you there, I'm almost done. But someone was looking in the mirror and you go, oh God, you messed up. Why did you make me this way? I mean, we were, we were good. You and I were good until I got that point. I gave. Why did you make me this way? It wasn't me. It was all the tacos that you ate. <laughs> <laughs> Some of us will look at God and go, how come this guy? How come that guy? How come you made them tall and you made me short? thought I was going to get away with stuff. We have issues with the design of the designer. And sometimes we rebel. I guess that teenagers, no matter how cute and good looking they may be, they look at them and say, oh, look at the hair, look at the eyes. Forget that. Let it go. God created the Father. Almighty God created you in His perfect wisdom just the way you are. Accept God and all of His designs, all of His plans. They said, pick a teenager's when go there, but what about us adults? Oh, why did you give me this <clears throat> spouse? I don't know, you picked that one, baby. <laughs> <laughs> we have all kinds of reasons to complain sometimes, believe me. I do too. Not that much, but I do. All of us do. How many of those complaints are literally against God, the Father? How many of those complaints, how many of those responses or reactions about, are about his wisdom, about his decisions, about his power? You guys aren't saying nothing, man, that's why I keep going. God wants you, wants you to fall in love with him. I don't know how better I can do that. I want my kids to love me. I really do. And you know, the, the, during those teenage years, it's come and go. Sometimes they do, and sometimes, but I think they do most of the time. It's difficult to show. But God wants the same type of commitment that you have for Jesus and how you have totally made up your mind. Jesus said you're a savior, your personal friend, and he has ears in the same way that you love Jesus. I want us to keep on thinking more about that God, Father, that Daddy, that Abba, that has so many good things for us, and so many wonderful plans, ideas, and yes, blessings. But sometimes even when he does bless us, we question that and go, Lord, all of those are blessings except for this one. I don't know about that. I'm not pointing any fingers or looking at anyone in particular. I'm just saying sometimes we question God. It's not wrong to question God. That's okay. That's human. But sooner or later, we need to take the next step and go trust and obey. Because there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, just to trust and obey. God bless you.